It was the savage killing of a young man in broad daylight on a busy stretch of motorway, witnessed by his terrified fiancée. The killer, a high-ranking career criminal who had killed before. A stunned nation was gripped by the horrific road rage murder of Stephen Cameron as it made headline news. This was a crime that shook Britain. Twenty-one-year-old electrician Stephen Cameron was in the prime of his life. But on the 19th of May, 1996, a lethal confrontation on a busy M25 motorway slip road would cost him his life. Police are describing the attack as a case of road rage. They're appealing for witnesses to the murder, which happened earlier this afternoon on a slip road between the A20 and the M25 near Swanley in Kent. Kent police launched a huge investigation sparking an international manhunt to bring Stephen's killer to justice. This is the story of the brutal murder of Stephen Cameron, told from the inside through the eyewitness accounts of the family and the detective at the heart of the case. Twenty-one-year-old Stephen Cameron worked as an electrician. He was fun-loving and had a winning personality. He was always teasing everybody. He was a very touchy-feely person. He had a, a way of coming up behind people and putting his arms around them and cuddling them. He always showed plenty of love. My well, Stephen had a fabulous personality. His attitude to life was absolutely fantastic. He was kind, generous, funny. He was my best friend. He was full of life, great fun to be with, just happy-go-lucky. Stephen was in a long-term relationship with his childhood sweetheart, 17-year-old Danielle Cable. They lived together with Stephen's devoted parents, Ken and Tony, in Swanley, Kent. Stephen met Danielle when she was at a bus stop, and this is her words to me. He looked at me, smiled at me, and I fell in love with him. And we all had our own lives, but we all were a very close family. We used to see each other all the time and do things together, go away together. We just had a perfect life. You just take it all for granted. It just seemed to us a normal, happy family life. Stephen and myself, we used to go to golf, go and play pool. Where I worked, that's where Stephen done his training. And I used to see him every day, all day. He was always coming around, and he said, you haven't got five pounds of it, I'm going to go and have some lunch. He's a tease of life out of me. He was really, really close. In December 1995, Stephen had planned a memorable Christmas. Christmas Eve, he came home and he'd bought her a ring. He just showed it to me and I said, oh dear, she doesn't even know. And he went over and see her mum and dad that evening and they were happy about it. So it was a really lovely Christmas that we spent together. They were looking forward to getting married later on and just having a happy family life together. Stephen and Danielle were making plans for their future. He was starting his own business with his cousin. They were starting up an electrical business together. Him and Danielle and his best friend, Darren, were moving in together. They'd rented a house in Chislehurst and they had everything to look forward to. He had his life ahead of him and he was so happy. But this happy family life would soon be shattered. Deep in the heart of the Kent countryside, just 10 miles from the Cameron family home, lived one of Britain's most notorious criminals, Kenneth James Noy. Kenny Noy was already well known to the British police and public. A notorious career criminal involved in the money laundering of the Brinks Matt stolen gold, the largest bullion robbery in British criminal history. We knew he was a criminal. We didn't know him. We knew there was a book um, that had been written, the Brinks Matt robbery, um, which my husband had read and Stephen also had read. In November 1983, 
a highly organized South London gang of six armed robbers slipped into a maximum security warehouse near Heathrow and stole three tons of gold bullion worth a staggering 26 million pounds. It was during the hunt for the missing gold that Kenny Noy was brought to the attention of the police. He was turning the gold into cash. But during the Brinks Matt investigation, he murdered undercover surveillance officer, Detective Constable John Fordham, in a frenzied knife attack, stabbing the officer multiple times in his chest. Sensationally acquitted on the grounds of self-defense, Noy was instead sentenced to 14 years in prison for his involvement in the conspiracy to handle stolen gold and VAT fraud. He was released early, seven years later, in 1994. Kenneth Noy hadn't long been out of prison. I was unashamed in the way in which he went about his life. He didn't have much shame about the fact that he's got 14 years in prison for... A... It was a seemingly normal Sunday morning at the Cameron family home. Because I'd been out the night before and Stephen had been drinking. Control myself. That morning, I had my two little granddaughters staying. They'd got in bed with Stephen and Danielle and was laughing and joking. And he told them that he was going to have them as his bridesmaids. And he was describing to them what sort of dresses they would have. I was up early because my mother, who lived across the road to us, wasn't very well. And she was in bed and I was going to go shopping. Stephen got up and he said, can you, you're going to cook my breakfast, jokingly, and I said, no, I said, I'm off out. And he said, oh, come on, Mum, please do my breakfast. I said, no, don't be so lazy, you do it. The last thing that he did was tell me he loved me. I left with the two granddaughters and took them shopping. Yeah, we had a cup of coffee together, had a little chat, because he'd been out on the Saturday night to a club. You're going to be ready in five? As Stephen and Danielle got ready, they discussed their plans for the day. Stephen was going up to London to buy some bagels for all his friends. They were all going to a football match that afternoon to watch Danielle's brother play football. Stephen suggested to Danielle that she drive the Bedford van. I'm gonna drive it. You'll be right. Danielle was driving because they'd been out the night before and Stephen had been drinking. Danielle never driven on a motorway in her life. She'd only just passed her test. Stephen decides that, Danielle, you can drive the vehicle, we'll go out and get some shopping. She was very reluctant to do that, but accepted that perhaps uh, to please him, she would drive it and get, get a motorway driving out of the way, as it were, but she wasn't very happy about it, especially a van. I was on a Sunday, it was about 10 past one. Uh, I was watching the Monaco Grand Prix. Just started the warm-up lap, and Stephen went off with Danielle. As they set off from their home to drive to London, they were unaware of the danger ahead of them. Sunday, 19th of May, 1996. Stephen Cameron and his fiancée Danielle Cable were planning to meet friends. Having been out drinking the night before, Stephen suggested that Danielle should drive his van. A reluctant Danielle agreed and they set off from their home in Kent to travel to London on the M25. Stephen was on the phone to his best friend, Darren, who he'd known since he was about four and a half, um, and they were going to share that, the house together that, that week they were moving in. They drove down Beach and Lee Lane, where they lived, and turned left onto London Road, heading towards the Swanley Interchange and the M25 motorway. So she drives onto the motorway at the Swanley Interchange. We think she cut somebody up or had taken someone's road, the Land Rover Discovery, pulled across the front of the vehicle when they stopped at the traffic lights just prior to joining the motorway. Outraged by this late lane change, the motorist stormed out of his Land Rover and approached the van. Stephen and Danielle had never seen him before. It was convicted criminal, Kenny Noy. Danielle is in a dreadful state at the driver's uh, wheel of this rascal van. Terrified, Danielle had no idea why her driving had just triggered such a tirade of abuse from the other motorist. 
Stephen stepped out of the van and approached the raging driver. Stephen wasn't even driving. He was just protecting his fiancée, which any man would do. Stephen Cameron came face to face with Kenny Noy. What he didn't know at the time, of course, was that the one person that he picked this uh, gesticulation with was Kenneth Noy, a known criminal. They quickly became embroiled in a heated exchange of words. There is a confrontation between Stephen and Kenneth Noy at the front of the rascal van, of which Danielle saw the lot. But the disagreement soon turned to physical violence. The first punch would appear to have been thrown by Kenneth Noy. Stephen instinctively defended himself. But whatever happened, Kenneth Noy was getting the worst of the, the confrontation that effectively he'd chosen to have. In a desperate bid to help her fiancé, Danielle frantically tried flagging down other motorists. Over 30 vehicles passed, but no one stopped to help. But it soon appeared that a younger, bigger and stronger Stephen had managed to defeat Noy. Instead of leaving, instead of just going, he goes back to his vehicle, to the passenger side, and comes back as Stephen's coming back into the rascal van with what we now know is a knife. Uh, Danielle is screaming at Stephen, he's got a knife, Steve. Stephen turned away to walk away and the man went back and got a knife. And the next thing you know, he's stabbed by Kenneth Noy, fatally in the heart. Noy twice plunged the knife into Stephen's body, puncturing his heart and liver. With the knife still in his hand, Kenny Noy got back into his vehicle and drove off at speed. Stephen had collapsed in Danielle's arms, covered in blood. The only person who had the presence of mind to think about getting the registration number of the Land Rover Discovery was indeed Stephen. With Stephen dying in her arms, a distressed Danielle phoned for an ambulance and then quickly called Ken Cameron. When Daniel phoned me, I just went into total panic mode. Stay calm. Stay there. I don't even remember driving to the roundabout. You know, I just got in the car and went. Just got there and I see Danielle and she was as white as a sheep. She was really, really white, pale, and she was shaking like a leaf. <laughs> So I sat him in the car and I went over to Stephen and, yeah. Within minutes, paramedics arrived on the scene, but they were too late. I just looked at him and just knew he was dead. He was as white as anything and he was, I just knew he was dead. They knew he was dead. That's, an image that's actually burnt into my head. I can still see him laying there. I was numb. My body just felt totally numb. If anyone had said to me, if you were to see your son lying in the road and you, and you knew he was dead, how would you react? I would have said I'd have gone hysterical. I was as calm as anything. I suppose something just takes over, doesn't it? The adrenaline just takes over. Stephen. 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 Ken drove back home to tell Tony. Just as I had got home, he rushed out the house and said to me, just get in the car. And I see Danielle was sitting in the front, so I got in the back with the two girls, not knowing what it was. And I, I, I always remember looking at Danielle and she was staring straight ahead. Her face was as white as snow. And I, I knew by my husband's panic that something was wrong. And I remember my husband was driving frantically and, and he said to me, Stephen's been stabbed. I just felt my heart was going to come out of my chest. It was just thumping and thumping. And I, I, th I just couldn't understand, you know, what, what was going on. I remember phoning my son. I, I was panicking and I thought, I've got to phone the two little girls' mum to tell, th tell them to meet us at the hospital because I didn't want them to be there. Daniel, we just sat there as quiet as anything. He's never said a word. 
We went into a small room and we all stood there just waiting for news. I knew Stephen was dead, but I couldn't tell her. I just couldn't tell her. The doctor came in and he told us that they couldn't save our Stephen. He died. I couldn't speak. I couldn't do anything. I just remember feeling numb. Everything was so normal that morning, and something like that just didn't seem real. And I couldn't believe that my Stephen could have died. I just wanted to be with him, and they did allow us to go and see him. And I remember holding his hand, and, you know, I don't know how I felt, I just felt numb. I, c I still can't believe that he, it was him laying there. I can't think how my husband must have felt because he actually saw him. I, I was spared that, but I wish I'd have been with him though because it'd be nice as a mother to be with him at that time. The one thing I always stuck in my mind, I can never remember seeing any blood. I can never remember seeing any blood at all. And he must have been covered in blood, quite truthful. I can't, don't remember, it must have blanked out. When your child leaves the house, you wave them goodbye, but you never think you're not going to see them again. The man has been stabbed to death after an argument with another driver. Police are describing the attack Stephen Cameron from Swanley was killed in front of his girlfriend during an argument on a motorway slip road. Danielle, whose surname isn't being released by the police, had been engaged to Stephen for six months. The shocking headlines the following day horrified the nation. There was stunned disbelief that a motorist could kill another over an argument about their driving. Kent police quickly mounted Operation Quern to hunt down Stephen's killer. It was one of the biggest criminal investigations in terms of resources for the Kent Police that we've ever had. We had something like in excess of 30 witnesses who had been using the motorway that junction at the time, and each of them saw different parts of what happened. Danielle, of course, saw everything that happened. He was driving a Land Rover when I came up. Out of all the witnesses that we had that saw, if not all the incident, but part of the incident, none of them got the whole registration number. None of them. With no vehicle registration number, Kent police were struggling to identify the killer. Had Kenny Noy managed to get away with the stabbing? 11. Electrician Stephen Cameron was in the prime of his life until he was fatally stabbed during a road rage incident on a busy motorway slip road. His dying words to his fiancée were to note down his killer's number plate. Me, plate. Kenny Noy, a notorious criminal, had fled the crime scene. There was someone out there that had stabbed Stephen and I wanted them caught. Although we had witnesses who could say what happened, Nobody identified the person, no one knew who he was, and we were in a very difficult position because we didn't have any forensic evidence that would link a suspect to the scene. There is a CCTV camera at that junction, and on that particular day, the 19th of May, it was not working. With no forensic evidence and no CCTV, Kent police were struggling to identify the M25 killer. The man disappeared in what we knew was an L-registered Land Rover Discovery. The difficulty you had was, of course, we didn't have the entire registration number. The police national computer showed 18,000 plus L-registered Land Rover discoveries, and they're only the legitimate ones, um, that were registered in the UK. But when you spoke to the witnesses, we had about five different colours. The colours ranged from green to maroon to blue to grey to black. 
Very soon we realised that we were going to find it very difficult to find that particular vehicle. If you don't have that significant lead for a named person within the first 48, 72 hours, you know it's going to be an uphill task. Two months after he was stabbed, the funeral of Stephen Cameron took place at St Mary's Church in Swanley. Friends and family gathered to pay their respects and say their final goodbye. We had a house full of people and we both felt lonely. Well, you just try and keep yourself going, trying to be strong. I was trying to be strong for Tony. Tony was trying to be strong for us, for me. But you just, just go through the motions of life, don't you? At the time, you're numb. I was doing things, don't remember what I was doing. It was as though I was standing up on the ceiling looking down at everybody. After Stephen died, I tried to get on with my life the best I could. It was very, very difficult. I just couldn't work anymore. I needed a nervous breakdown. I just couldn't face going to work. I couldn't cope with work. Uh, if it had been for Tony, I don't know what I'd have done because she was an absolute brick. The grieving family's focus turned once more to the police investigation and finding the M25 killer. There was lots of points where you think that he isn't going to get caught, he isn't going to get found. And that was the worst part, not knowing where he was. We wanted him caught. For Stephen's sake, we would have gone to the ends of the world for that to happen. I did start to question if they would actually catch him in my own, own mind. I used to phone up Nick Biddis, the superintendent, and beat him up every week on the phone. I to give him our time. There is always a uh, pressure for us to solve such dreadful crimes. There's pressures both from uh, the police, as it were, the public, the media, uh, and especially the family. I mean, uh, Danielle's lost a fiance. Ken and Tony, of course, they've lost a son. A heartbroken Danielle was their key witness and Kent police desperately needed her to help solve the murder. And what did Stephen do? Danielle was extremely cooperative and wanted justice for Stephen and the family. She was always available for me to interview her or to get some information if there was anything and I always kept regular contact with her, with Ken and Tony Cameron. So when the man hit him, that must have just made him really angry. Danielle's emotions gave me the strength because I knew I had to help her. It was a sort of a motherly instinct, if you like, and I, I felt I had to be strong for her. He was just trying to defuse. To see someone you love stabbed to death and die in your arms, especially because she was so young and she, she was so hurt by it all. Danielle provided the police with a description of the vehicle and Stephen's killer whilst intelligence was beginning to shed some light on the identity of the Land Rover owner. There was information that came in in relation to local criminals, which is not unusual in a murder inquiry. Kenneth Noy was the sort of guy that wouldn't hide away um, and would be part of his local community, be seen. Um, it was suggested to us that that he disappeared. This key piece of intelligence shocked those involved. I couldn't imagine anyone that would have gone back and got a knife. So I obviously thought it was some sort of villain to do something like that and to, and to do it and run and not show any remorse. It might be road rage, but to me it was murder. We were extremely surprised to think that somebody of Kenneth Noy's uh, professional criminal standard would get involved in such a, such a crime. But of course he's disappeared, so we need to look at it. We never for a moment imagined that he would have been there to have murdered Stephen. It was a million to one chance that he would meet such a criminal. I didn't believe it, first off. I just could not believe it. A person with his stature in the criminal world at 1.20 on a Sunday afternoon and would do such a stupid thing in broad daylight in front of loads of people. Because he's a person who's well known in the area. I just didn't believe it. 
But Kenny Noy had realized the enormity of his crime. After stabbing Stephen Cameron to death, Kenneth Noy raced back to his home, where he made a number of frantic calls, packed a suitcase with cash, and left. Within 24 hours of the murder, his phone went dead. His mobile phone went dead. And of course, um, we, we had no means of, uh, of finding out what, what communication he may have been using. Clearly, he was using something, uh, but we didn't have any, any way of monitoring it. We obviously searched his house. His associates and friends and his family claimed they hadn't seen him or he'd gone. I uh, don't know where he was, uh, but he'd had nothing to do with such a crime. Nobody would tell us anything. Nobody knew anything. Hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. He just disappeared off the face of the earth. With the help of his underworld contacts, Noy was whisked across the channel by helicopter, fleeing the country. We knew he had a criminal background. He had friends in the criminal world that would help him to stay away. And we knew he would have all these things to help him. He was desperate to cover his tracks and raise as little suspicion as possible. We then soon realised that Kenneth Noy not only had disappeared, but the Land Rover Discovery that he had been driving has disappeared. Uh, there was another, what we called a doppelganger vehicle, had been stuck on his driveway. This vehicle, which looked exactly the same colour and type of the one that we were looking for, was bought for cash. And that vehicle landed up on Kenneth Noy's driveway. I think it was put there so as if anybody was casually passing by to say that, you know, Kenneth Noy's disappeared, but his vehicle's still on his driveway. Very quickly, the press discovered the identity of the prime suspect and took a renewed interest in the story. The press found out that we were looking to try and find Kenneth Noy, who was well known in media circles, and therefore it was a good story. Sales papers. You guys are going to put you in charge of getting all the witnesses. You want his money. I think the police knew or thought it was Kenneth Noy for about two weeks after Stephen died. And they were just looking for him. But I don't think they wanted it broadcast. I didn't really want his name mentioned at all because I knew that it could potentially harm any fair trial. No matter who the defendant is, they're entitled to a fair trial. And the next thing you know, it's on the Sunday papers. Pictures, everything. Kent Police are after Kenneth Noy in relation to the M25 murders. Does anybody know where he is? I found out Noy was the chief suspect when I bought the News of the World one Sunday morning. And which they was totally outrageous. They shouldn't have done that. I suppose what I could say was it was it could have been as a result of the public knowing that of course made people aware uh, and kept it in the the minds of the public, kept the uh, the, the story and the, uh, the case going. The story was generating huge amounts of interest. Reported sightings of Noy started coming in. We had sightings of Kenneth Noy people who thought they'd seen Kenneth Noy from all over the world. He went from Russia to Brazil, uh, he'd gone to South America to have his uh, face changed. Kenneth Noy is dead, definitely dead. And I said, unless I'll see his dead body and I have his fingerprints off it, I won't believe it. But there were sightings all over the place. I'm surprised he wasn't seen on the moon. Two years into the murder investigation, Kent police finally got a major breakthrough they received reports that Noy was residing in Spain. Noy kept a very low profile and of course changed his identity uh, with a new passport in the, in the name of Green. His lifestyle was one where uh, he was living in a, in a very remote house. He would be drinking in bars, he was keeping himself to himself, but clearly wasn't a hermit. The police needed to confirm that the sightings were indeed that of Kenneth James Noy. But media intrusion into the investigation was making things difficult. The problem I had was 
the minute I sent any officers abroad, it would only be 24, most 48 hours, before the press found out. Eventually, I ran it as a secret inquiry. I sent the officers out there with the remit, all I need you to do is to go out there and see if you can see this guy and tell me whether it's Kenneth Noy. Don't forget that in 1984, Kenneth Noy had killed a police officer in the grounds of his house at West Kingsdown. And I've sent two officers out with absolutely no backup to a foreign country to see if they can find this man and identify him. With their mission outlined, the undercover surveillance officers tracked Noy down to a bar. Those officers actually knew Kenneth Noy because of obviously his previous convictions uh, and they gave me a positive response, it's definitely him. It was a big major breakthrough but it was sort of opening wounds up because two years on we were, you know, settling down a little bit. But bringing Kenneth Noy to justice was by no means a straightforward feat. We still haven't got either any forensic evidence or anybody actually identifying Kenneth Noy as the person who stabbed Stephen Cameron. But the bottom line was that in order to link him with the crime on the 19th of May, I needed Danielle to identify him. She actually was the only one that actually looked him in the eyes and saw him that day. It was now up to Danielle to bring Stephen's killer to justice. But two years after the stabbing, would Danielle be able to positively identify her fiancé's killer? After fatally stabbing Stephen Cameron on a busy motorway slip road, notorious criminal Kenny Noy fled the country. It sparked an international manhunt to bring him to justice. Having finally located Noy in Spain, Kent police now needed to positively identify him as Stephen's killer. There was only one person who was capable of doing that, the only person who witnessed the entire murder, Stephen's fiance, Danielle Cable. The identification out in Spain was, in my view, the most significant point of the whole investigation. Clearly, if she didn't identify the person out there, who we knew was Kenneth Noy, as the person who had killed her fiancé, Stephen Cameron, then the whole case in terms of Kenneth Noy would have fallen apart. And I kept regular contact with Danielle, told her that at some stage, Danielle, it may be that you have to go somewhere outside this country and may, you may have to try and identify the person responsible. When the police came round to see us and inform us that Danielle had actually been taken away on a plane to identify the suspect. Um, it came as a shock because we had no idea that they were that close to catching him. He didn't tell us where, he just said Daniel was on the plane as I speak to you at the moment. We think we found him. I was elated. Quite me eyes out. Oh, I was really concerned. I was really worried about her because I knew she would be upset. I knew she'd be frightened. Of course there were dangers in doing that. There were dangers for her welfare. So much so that when we eventually decided that she'd have to go out there to do this, I decided to do it in as public an area as possible. What we were trying to avoid was, if you like, a one-to-one -one situation. Fortunately for us, we went out to a restaurant where it was absolutely packed. Danielle was able to look through a window And she was positive in her identification. Nick bid his phoned us and said, we've got him, she's ID'd him, it's him. And we were just, you know, so relieved. It's about two years after Stephen died, which was an eternity, but they actually found him. We were then able, as a result of that identification, to obtain a warrant for his arrest in the UK. Within 24 hours, Kent police were granted a warrant for Kenny Noy's arrest. Kenneth Noy was a creature of habit and was, um, he was a person who frequented 
much the same bar as in the Barbat area. And uh, he was located in a particular bar where he was sitting outside on the seafront and was accompanied by a young lady. The Spanish authorities were actually fully briefed as to Kenneth Noy's previous convictions and his previous history as regards his violence towards officers. And they, I can assure you, took no chances when it came to arresting him. He was very quickly grabbed, immobilised, handcuffed and taken into custody. With Noy arrested, the process for his extradition back to the UK began. A lengthy process that would take a year to complete. It was for the British courts to decide whether it was being dealt with in accordance with the law, and they granted it, and he was duly extradited three years almost to the day that uh, the crime had been committed. Initially, he claimed he had nothing to do whatsoever with the incident on the M25 on the 19th of May and knew nothing about the murder of Stephen Cameron and that the British police were after him because of him being acquitted of murder of a police officer. That was his claim. That is the problem. That is the problem with everything that happened last time. Once he was brought back to the country, he then accepted that it was indeed him that had killed Stephen Cameron on the 19th of May but that it was in self-defence. The guy actually attacked me. That's what you've got to understand, he attacked me. He had to hold his hands up. Yes, I was there, it was me, but it was self-defence. But he was never self-defence. Stephen wasn't carrying a knife. He was the one carrying a knife. Four years after killing Stephen Cameron, Kenneth Noy stood trial at the Old Bailey. He pleaded not guilty. It's very important to go to the trial and see him face the music and see justice done. The first time I saw Kenneth Noy in court, I wanted him to be dead for killing my son. Stabbing him twice, he intended to kill him. And I just wanted justice for Stephen. That's all I've ever wanted. When he gave evidence at court, he said that he believed he had to leave the scene, leave the country, because the police would make sure that he got convicted of a crime he never committed, and therefore he wasn't going to hang around and wait to be arrested. He was trying to make out that Stephen was the violent person, that it was in self-defence. He even said in court that he thought Stephen was going to throw him over the bridge and all sorts of silly things he came out with. He's a maniac. He's a psychopath. What did it do? But it was Danielle's witness statement that would be of crucial importance. The key part to this case, and the one that linked it all together, was the identification of Kenneth Noy by Danielle Cable. Forensically, there was nothing there, and unless we had somebody who could identify the person who stuck the knife into Stephen, then we would never have got a conviction. Part of his defence was that he had been identified unlawfully by Danielle. It was proven that he wasn't. Danielle was a key witness, and the one thing she always said was that his eyes, evil eyes, and that's what she see when she went out to Spain and seen his evil eyes. That's when she knew it was him. I hereby sentence you to life imprisonment. Kenneth Noy was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Stephen Cameron. He would have to serve a minimum term of 16 years before he could be considered for parole. At the time, I, I, I felt elated that he'd been found guilty, but I felt deflated that life didn't mean life because he got 16 years. To me, he, he should never come out. He doesn't deserve to be out. He showed no re remorse. Um, I feel that Stephen got justice because we caught the person that did it, but I don't feel that there's justice, the fact that he's going to one day walk free and have some sort of life. Me personally, I think the law now should be that anyone who carries a knife, is caught carrying a knife, should be put in prison. It's treated totally different to gun crimes, which I, I think people die with knives and people die with guns. Why is it treated totally different to gun crimes? I don't know where she is now. 
I don't know what her identity is, and neither do I need to know. All I want to make sure is that she can get on and lead the rest of her life in, uh, in a happy way and a content way. We haven't seen Danielle since 1998, and we absolutely loved Danielle. She was a wonderful little girl. She really was a wonderful little girl, and we both miss her. She was a very brave girl to have done what she did, because she could have easily turned around and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to get involved in it, because uh, it's likely to be a problem. But I think she's a very brave girl and should be given all credit for that. Stephen would have been a fantastic father, absolutely fantastic father. Uh, we'd have had fantastic grandchildren with him, which we've been totally denied by an evil man. You live your life, but you're not happy. Inside, your heart's broken. No one can mend that. Our son Michael can't even talk about Stephen. He can't face that his brother's dead. You know, but yeah, everyone's got on with their life. Which, you know, you know, we've had to get on with their life. You have to, don't you? Life goes on. But you don't stop mourning, you don't stop missing Stephen. I'm, I miss him every day, all day. Rachel Nickell's body found on Wimbledon Common, Colin Stagg languishing in jail after a controversial police investigation while the real killer roamed free. It's tonight's main event, the start of a brand new and exclusive series of crimes that shook Britain at nine. Next on CI, a community divided, crime stories. Next on CI, a community divided, crime stories. was the savage killing of a young man in broad daylight on a busy stretch of motorway, witnessed by his terrified fiancée. The killer, a high-ranking career criminal who had killed before. A stunned nation was gripped by the horrific road rage murder of Stephen Cameron as it made headline news. This was a crime that shook Britain. Twenty-one-year-old electrician Stephen Cameron was in the prime of his life. But on the 19th of May, 1996, a lethal confrontation on a busy M25 motorway slip road would cost him his life. Police are describing the attack as a case of road rage. They're appealing for witnesses to the murder, which happened earlier this afternoon on a slip road between the A20 and the M25 near Swanley in Kent. Kent police launched a huge investigation sparking an international manhunt to bring Stephen's killer to justice. This is the story of the brutal murder of Stephen Cameron, told from the inside through the eyewitness accounts of the family and the detective at the heart of the case. Twenty-one-year-old Stephen Cameron worked as an electrician. He was fun-loving and had a winning personality. He was always teasing everybody. He was a very touchy-feely person. He had a, a way of coming up behind people and putting his arms around them and cuddling them. He always showed plenty of love. My well, Stephen had a fabulous personality. His attitude to life was absolutely fantastic. He was kind, generous, funny. He was my best friend. He was full of life, great fun to be with, just happy-go-lucky. Stephen was in a long-term relationship with his childhood sweetheart, 17-year-old Danielle Cable. They lived together with Stephen's devoted parents, Ken and Tony, in Swanley, Kent. Stephen met Danielle when she was at a bus stop, and this is her words to me. He looked at me, smiled at me, and I fell in love with him. And we all had our own lives, but we all were a very close family. We used to see each other all the time and do things together, go away together. We just had a perfect life. You just take it all for granted. It just seemed to us a normal, happy family life. Stephen and myself, we used to go to golf, go and play pool. 
where I worked, that's where Stephen done his training. And I used to see him every day, all day. He's always coming around, and Dad, you haven't got five pounds of it, I'm going to go and have some lunch. He used to tease the life out of me. We was really, really close. In December 1995, Stephen had planned a memorable Christmas. Christmas Eve, he came home and he'd bought her a ring. He just showed it to me and I said, oh dear, she doesn't even know. And he went over and see her mum and dad that evening and they were happy about it. So it was a really lovely Christmas that we spent together. They were looking forward to getting married later on and just having a happy family life together. Stephen and Danielle were making plans for their future. He was starting his own business with his cousin. They were starting up an electrical business together. Him and Danielle and his best friend, Darren, were moving in together. They'd rented a house in Chislehurst and they had everything to look forward to. He had his life ahead of him and he was so happy. 